working with um, uh, Joe Kitchens uh, back in 2013 and 14 uh, on some of the legwork for the Hickory Log uh, collection coming to here to Funk Heritage. And so um, that's sort of how I first got involved with the Funk Heritage Center and um, yet being lured away to, to God's country up in western North Carolina um, and to take a little bus man holiday and um, back down to North Georgia. I really enjoyed that. So uh, thank you, Jeff, for the um, invitation. I'm um, also happy to see a former student of mine from West Georgia who I want to recognize, Roy Palmer, there in the front. And Roy's an up-and-coming uh, public historian, anthropologist, archaeologist, and so keep your eye on that guy and uh, give him a good job someday. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll, I'll be talking today, um, I, I know this is a Georgia uh, uh, History Month lecture series, and I promise I'll, I'll, I'll get some Georgia-relevant information, but, but the focus of my talk about the ancestral heartland um, for the Cherokee in West North Carolina. Um, I, I sort of make this slide for when I give these talks for like um, professors who are sending their, their students to, to, to lectures for extra credit. These are like their two bullet points you have to write down when you go back and write your extra credit essay, right? So these are your two extra credit points for, for today. My talk, the first is that um, uh, in addition to sort of Western science, um, and archaeological science, traditional Cherokee perspectives are, are vital, are vitally important for understanding the, the cultural landscape of West North Carolina and, 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 and the cultural landscape, of course, of, of North Georgia as well. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit um, uh, from, from both theoretical and methodological as well as from, from some personal experience working closely with members of the Eastern Band um, about the ways in which uh, traditional Cherokee perspectives are really important for understanding um, uh, the archaeological record. And then uh, the second key point that I'm, I'm going to make, partly sort of a case study toward the end of the talk, is that we so often think about uh, the Cherokee experience um, in the past as, as totally in the past. And we tend, I think, erroneously to sort of separate um, living Cherokee from their past, partly in the way that we, we think about removal, the way we, we think about the Trail of Tears. Um, but this cultural landscape in, in, in the mountains of North Georgia and Western North Carolina is still a Cherokee landscape, and it's still a landscape that is marked um, by Cherokee monuments that their ancestors erected over the last thousand years. And so mounds are, are not just somehow a thing that is, is here but of the past, but they're a vital part of today's landscape. And I'm, and I'm going to do a case study of the Nequasi Mound in Franklin, North Carolina. Has anybody been there? Just out of curiosity, a couple of folks have been past the Nequasi Mound in Franklin, um, and talk about how that mound site is not just a historic or archaeological site to visit, but is, among other things, a political football that gets kicked around uh, by state and local and, and Cherokee governments, and is very much a part of the landscape today. So those are my two extra credit points for you. So, <laughs> so now the students would leave because they've written down the things and they would go, but you can stay. So, um, and, I'll, and I'll give just a little bit of biographical introduction um, uh, here. Um, this is where I got my start uh, doing archaeology. Um, uh, the image here, a couple of images and, and maps here. Um, this map points to the Ravensford site, and, and the Ravensford archaeology site is what we called the location of the new uh, Cherokee K through 12 high school, which is what you see in the upper right hand corner of, of this slide. Um, in 2000, uh, leading up to 2004, 2005, over a years long process, the Eastern Band of Cherokee negotiated a land swap with the National Park Service, which is weird because it's their land, but they negotiated a land swap because that's how these things work with the National Park Service over 40 acres of land to build a new uh, school, K-12, um, to replace their aging school, which was located right in the heart of sort of Cherokee's tourist district and, and frankly I think was probably psychologically a difficult place for kids to go to school, to, to be honest. Um, this is the school as it is now, absolutely gorgeous uh, uh, facility. You'll note you've got your... Um, the track and the, and, and the um, uh, stickball field there in the middle, behind that are the two main school complexes. Those buildings are seven-sided, uh, representing the seven Cherokee clans, and so there's sort of Cherokee design elements that are involved in that school. Um, but before that school was constructed, archaeologists were hired to come in and excavate that site in advance of that school being built. Um, the archaeologist who, who was the um, manager of that project was uh, uh, Paul Webb, who uh, is the one who also excavated the Hickory Log site, which we have here in Funk Heritage Center. So things kind of are kind of connected here a little bit. Um, but I was, I was in my mid-20s when I was working out at Ravensford. I had just graduated from college. I was working as an archaeological field technician on this project. 
um, those are affectionately called shovel bumps um, in, in, in the discipline. And so I was one of those folks working on my hands and knees for two years, excavating, um, among other things, um, uh, six pairs of burned uh, 18th century Cherokee houses, um, uh, dozens of Mississippian period uh, structure patterns. What you're looking at here is the, is the burned pattern of a roughly 1740 Cherokee winter house. Um, can you guys see it? It's a little bit dark, but the sort of like reddish soil there, that's burned and collapsed clay walls. Um, the, the brown soil here is, is collapsed and eroded roof fall from, from where the building collapsed. Um, what you also see in this picture is a group of um, a couple dozen Cherokee high school students. This was the AP US history class um, from the, the high school coming to visit the archeological site. And this is a great artifact because if this picture were taken today, all the students would be doing this. <laughs> out, right? But this was 2004, 2005. They didn't all have smartphones yet. But I, but I actually would wager that even if they um, they'd still be paying attention here because they were really interested in what was going on. Um, and, and that was a really transformative moment for me, spending um, uh, over a year working at an archaeological site where you had a, a descendant community right there. And you had Native American people, Cherokee people, coming to that site to, to learn about the archaeology, to offer their own perspectives on the archaeology. If you think about the Cherokee clan system, seven Cherokee clans, you know, there, there's at least a one in seven chance that all those kids are related through the clan system, to the people who lived in that house, you know? People who lived and died and were, and were buried in that house. So um, that makes academic discussions about who owns the past and how you interpret the archeological record, not just academic, but personal, right? I mean, these are kids who are related to the people who lived in that house. And so that, that made me really interested in doing a kind of archeology span um, that, that was engaged with local communities. Um, the, well, TRC's work and, and, and the work at the Ravensport site became a kind of model for collaborative archaeology in the southeast. It was written about this is American Archaeology Magazine, sort of popular glossy archaeology magazine. Um, that's former chief Michelle Hicks with Tasha Benachek, the, the field director out there talking about the archaeological site. Um, uh, Paul Webb, moving from left to right, Paul Webb, who's got his work out there. Benny Keel and Russ Townsend. Russ is the, the CEO. Um, uh, and then my mom likes me to point out that I was in the, in the magazine there in the very <laughs> corner there. Um, but, uh, but, but I had, I had, I had the great opportunity to sort of come of age as an archeologist working in this collaborative way and, and that's informed my work since. Um, in 2011, I, I uh, earned my University of Georgia during one of the worst job markets for academics probably in about 15 or 20 years. There, there were no jobs. And so I cobbled together a postdoc with a lot of help from the University of Georgia, from the Tribal Historic Preservation Foundation, from Duke Energy, um, the Cherokee Preservation Foundation, um, and some other funding agencies. And, and in a collaborative project with the uh, Eastern Band, worked on a project to um, map and record poorly understood mound sites in the, in the westernmost counties of North Carolina. And so some of the work that I'll be presenting today comes from that postdoc that postdoctoral research going out and mapping mounds and towns ac across the western part of the state. Um, after I completed that project, uh, 2012, the job market was slightly better, and I had the great fortune to be hired at the University of West Georgia, where I began, among other things, um, doing archaeological field schools uh, collaboratively with the Tribal Historic Preservation Office of the Eastern Band. Um, in this photograph, Roy dug some of these holes, uh, these square excavation units here. Um, he's not in the picture. Um, but I brought students from West Georgia up to Cherokee, where they worked with, among other people, um, uh, this is Bo Carroll, he's an enrolled member of the Eastern Band, he's one of the tribal archaeologists, and this is, um, this is the, the just recently departed uh, Cherokee beloved man, Jerry Wolf, who some of you may have heard of if you sort of follow um, uh, uh, the, the, the sort of, you know, Cherokee culture and, and pay attention to what's happening in, in Indian country today. So Jerry Wolf was in his 90s when this photograph was taken. He was a um, World War II uh, D-Day vet, um, among other things. But he lived right near this archeological site. And, and so one day he just stopped by and um, just got out and chatted with our students and, and talked a little bit about you know, what was there at that archeological site there in Cherokee. And um, you, know, you can ask Roy, but, but I, I think it's fair to say that those students learned as much about Cherokee culture, current contemporary Cherokee culture, as they did, as they did archeology. span I think that's really important for, for to have real meaningful interaction with the Cherokee community. Um, this is where I teach today. Um, this photograph was, 
you know, taken by our marketing department on a picture perfect day. It's not always this pretty, um, uh, but uh, I do. I, I teach now at Western Carolina University in Cullowee, North Carolina. Um, a little bit of Cherokee language. That, that uh, suffix we is a locative suffix. It means like town or ville or place of. Cullowee is a reference to Judith Culler Rock. Ju uh, that's a petroglyph just a couple miles from campus. Judith Culler, of course, is the famous um, uh, uh, giant in Cherokee mythology, Cherokee cosmology. So um, uh, we teach at Judith Culler's place. And Judith Culler, as a mythological figure in Cherokee culture, among other things, was a kind of teacher. He taught Cherokee uh, 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 important um, uh, knowledge about plants and animals. He taught them how to be proper Cherokee. So I think it's very fitting uh, that we have a university in Judicala's place, this Cherokee teacher. Um, uh, there, there we are. Um, and in Western Carolina, we also have, um, at any given time, as many as about 100 uh, Cherokee students, enrolled members of, of the Eastern Band, who are, um, uh, among other things, in my classes. So um, again, for me, uh, being an anthropologist and archaeologist, really thinking about these issues of how do you interpret the past, um, it, it's not academic. I'm right now teaching contemporary Cherokee culture and history with three Cherokee students in my class. Right. So who should be teaching who, right? I mean, <laughs> they're the ones who know this stuff, yeah. So um, so I, I think in, in large part, you know, being in being in Kaluuya, um, so close to the Eastern Band, working closely with, with the Eastern Band, that's really informed the way that I think about the, the archaeological record. Um, I think archaeologists maybe who, who are farther away might have the luxury of thinking about interpretations of, of the past will, 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 will be interpreted by, by living Native American people. So, um, but, but these are things that I think about every day. Um, okay, so, um, so now I'm actually going to start my talk. There, there we go. Um, and I want to talk about the uh, sort of the built environment, the, the archaeology of the, um, the, the Cherokee landscape. So uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty remarkable, you know, doing the drive today. Just a lot of things are, are sort of coming, coming together here. Um, the, the closest spot on the map to where I teach now would, would be uh, Ketua or Gadua. And Gadua is the Cherokee mother town from, from which the Cherokee emerged. It's outside of Bryson City, North Carolina, outside of Cherokee, North Carolina. There's still a mound of Gadua, which I'll, I'll show you here momentarily. In, in Cherokee origin mythology, um, this is sort of the place from which people emerged. There's a point at Gadua at that, at that mound site where you can stand, and on a clear day, you can see Clingman's Dome, uh, the highest point in the Great Smokies. You can see Water Rock Knob. Um, you are just surrounded by mountains. And so if you stand at the right place, Gadua, at Gadua, you really have this sense of being in the center of the world. You feel like you're surrounded by mountains there. It's, it's a really powerful landscape. So I left that landscape today, and driving here to, um, uh, to, to Reinhardt University, um, I sort of went right through, you know, just drawing like a diagonal line right down from, from Western North Carolina in, into the, the Cherokee Nation. Um, this map is, is sort of a composite of the uh, Royce map of the 19th century showing um, all the uh, uh, land that was ceded by Cherokee in, in territory. So it gives you a sense of the ancestral uh, Cherokee landscape. And of course, it's huge. Um, Cherokee claim uh, over 140,000 uh, 140, square miles of territory. This, includes, this, of course, includes not just their towns and villages, but hunting territory, places where they trade. Um, but uh, here, here in North Georgia, of course, we're not only in sort of old Cherokee territory, places with, with lots of, of antiquity, but we're, of course, in that um, early 19th century core of, of the Cherokee Nation as, as well. Um, uh, so I'll talk today mostly about North Carolina, but I, but I did want to sort of recognize that we're here. You know, we're here in this core of, uh, of Cherokee country, and uh, some of the same, same things that I'll discuss about uh, mounds and archaeology in Western North Carolina, a lot of these same ideas would apply uh, to, to mound sites in, in this part of the world as well. Um, so as, as Jeff said in the opening of my talk, I do, I'm very interested in, in the archaeology of mounds, the archaeology of town sites, and I just wanted to put um, sort of mound sites in Western North Carolina into a, a broader perspective. Um, Native Americans in the southeastern U.S. have been building mounds as early as the Middle Archaic period, actually. Some of our earliest mounds are over 5,000, 6,000 years old down in the lower Mississippi Valley, sites like Watson Spring. Um, and so the mound building that we see around here, for example, at, at Etowa, which folks have probably been to, or at least are, are sort of aware, broader cultural practice of, of monumental earthwork building. Um, this is a picture of the Newark earthworks in Ohio. 
these date to the middle woodland period, so say just give or take some, you know, uh, AD 100, 200, somewhere in there, so roughly 2,000 year old tradition of, of building complex earthworks. Um, this is an early surveyor's uh, uh, sort of rough drawing of the Sapelo Island shell ring in Georgia. This is late archaic, so that would be 2500 BC, making shells, at, uh, make, making mounds out of, out of uh, exhausted uh, oyster and clam shells, so that's a kind of ritual uh, mound building. And then, of course, we've got the, the granddaddy of them all, Monk's Mound in Cahokia, uh, Mississippian period, so sort of a climax there, 1200 AD. Um, so Native Americans living in, in, in North Carolina, Cherokee ancestors, they're, they're part of this broader tradition of, of mound building, earthwork construction that's really common across the southeast. And I would argue that this kind of basic architectural grammar of mound building is something that uh, uh, Cherokee and their ancestors and Creek ancestors all understood in the same way that we understand the architectural grammar of you know, putting columns in front of buildings, right? You know, think about courthouses and banks and universities. I mean, even like new buildings at universities will have, you know, sort of Greco-Roman looking columns in the front because we, we very quickly recognize that as a symbol of authority and a symbol of civilization, right? And so mounds, I think, it's, 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 you know, it's not a perfect analogy, but for, for Native American cultures, you know, carry that same kind of gravitas, you know? Um, they, they, uh, they carry that, that sense of tradition um, and, 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 and legacy. Um, this is a 1937 photograph of the Gudua Mound, um, and I'm pronouncing this Gudua the way the Eastern Cherokee would pronounce it instead, instead of Kedua, but the Gudua Mound, um, photograph 1937. And Gudua Mound is one of the largest mounds in Western North Carolina. It was known a mother town, one of the most important Cherokee towns. And there's this mound that was given from Swimmer, uh, uh, pictured here, one of James Mooney's principal consultants for his famous ethnography of Cherokee. But according to Swimmer, at, at big mounds like Gadua and, and at the Mount uh, Nkwasi, which I'll show you soon, these mounds were considered to have a central sacred fire that still burned. And, and, and he really, as I understand it from speaking with, with Eastern Cherokee today, when he says that it was still burning in, in 1900, he means it was still burning. Like that that fire was still alive in that mound, that these mound sites are living places with a, with a sacred living fire um, that in, in a religious ceremonial sense is still burning. Um, every year at the green corn ceremony in, in Cherokee communities, an annual festival in, in the fall, um, individual uh, households would extinguish their house fires and they would relight their house fires with fire taken um, from the central hearth of, of the townhouse on top of these mounds, um, linking individual households in the community with those um, uh, uh, central sacred fires. There, there is a also oral, oral tradition, oral story, um, that at, during removal, uh, coals were taken uh, from this last townhouse at Gadua and taken on the trail of tears and kept burning to relight the townhouse at, at Tahlequah, Oklahoma, when that, when that new council house was, was constructed. Um, and so th these are places that are very powerful uh, uh, ceremonially. Um, and and that, that symbolism of, of a mound uh, uh, containing a townhouse and, and, a, and a sacred central fire, that goes way back um, uh, in, in the southeast. Um, we also know that Western North Carolina, I'm borrowing a map here from one of my colleagues at Western Carolina, Dr. Brett Riggs. Um, uh, Western North Carolina uh, had dozens of named Cherokee towns, uh, as did South Carolina and, and Tennessee and, and North Georgia as well. Um, these are towns whose names were recorded in uh, 18th century documents, military expeditions, you know, uh, uh, the travels of William Bartram um, and, and, and other, other accounts. And so we know that we have all these named towns across our landscape, and each of these towns, thinking archaeologically, would have a townhouse. It would have one of these low uh, townhouse mounds. And so um, these, are, uh, these are places that, that really should still be there archaeologically on the landscape. Many mounds have been damaged from development, uh, from agriculture, but in terms of just you know, sort of thinking like an archaeologist, all of these named towns uh, have townhouses out there. So you can think about this landscape that we drive through. You know, today, I actually live in Asheville, so um, I, I sort of did sort of an, an end around over the middle towns, but I came right through the valley towns today. And, and you know, you get out of Anahilla Gorge, and that valley river just opens up so wide, this, this, that huge wide floodplain. Um, you know, there, there are at least a good 10 townhouses out there somewhere in those fields. 
um, commemorating uh, th these Cherokee towns. Uh, if you think about that from a traditional perspective, you know, those townhouse fires are still burning. They're still out there in that valley. Um, and for, for Cherokee people, that landscape today ha has just been, you know, sort of flattened out by, by farming and development. But that's, you know, that's, that's land that their ancestors uh, sanctified with those, with those mound sites. And, and those, places are, those places are still there. Um, so we're going to go back in time now just a little bit just to, to give some kind of deep history of mound building in, in the region. Not that way, but this way. There we go. Um, mound building in western North Carolina specifically, so thinking about this, this, this core um, uh, of Cherokee occupation, uh, goes back to about AD 100, AD 200, what we call the Woodland Period. Um, and there are two especially prominent mounds, one at the Garden Creek site outside of Canton, North Carolina, and then one on the Biltmore Estate grounds, if you can believe that. Anybody been to Biltmore? Yeah, there we go. There you hey, hands going up, yep. Um, right, so there's a Woodland Period mound at the Biltmore Estate, uh, which is excavated by Appalachian State, early 2000s, um, as well as a mound at the Garden Creek site, um, just outside of Canton, North Carolina. At Garden Creek, there is, uh, this is a picture of the mound being excavated by UNC in the 1960s. Um, uh, there are exotic trade artifacts, exotic um, uh, artifacts from Ohio, these little uh, Flint Ridge shirts, it's just not local stuff, um, human figurines, uh, careful, uh, carefully executed plummets, Ohio pottery, um, uh, a lot of point E there on the slide, but pottery from Ohio, as well as local people are exchanging things at Garden Creek in um, this broad uh, uh, social network that archaeologists call the um, Hopo Interaction Sphere, where during the Middle Woodland period, Native American communities are trading and exchanging exotic artifacts all up and down uh, the East Coast, all up and down the Eastern Woodlands. So at, at um, Garden Creek, for example, um, folks appear to be um, uh, mining mica and sort of um, inserting mica into this exchange network. Uh, mica from North, West North Carolina is going out to, to be uh, crafted into, into beautiful carved uh, mica objects. And then uh, folks are trading in things like exotic shirts from Ohio, um, uh, copper. Um, so you know, almost 2,000 years ago, Native American communities are already uh, communicating with each other, talking with each other, trading things across this broad landscape. So, um, you know, sometimes when we talk about culture history, we tend to put Native American communities into like little separate blobs on a map or something. You know, like here's your Cherokee area, here's your Creek area. Uh, but in reality, these folks have been communicating, trading for thousands of years. And so in the Cherokee heartland of, of Western North Carolina, um, for, for a thousand years and, and longer, uh, people have been involved in the complex trade and exchange of artifacts. Um, this is a sort of wonky archaeological map from the Biltmore Estate uh, uh, mound. But what you can see here is uh, sort of one quarter of the plan view um, uh, excavation map of, of that mound. And so uh, this is a, a, was a low uh, circular mound that was sort of built out rather than up. Um, but you had a low sort of you know, conical circular mound. And then right there in the middle, where you can see a, a big sort of dark dark circle, um, there was a large central pole, a central pole uh, uh, emanating out of the center of that mound. Um, and in speaking with um, uh, sort of traditional uh, Cherokee experts like uh, Tom Belt, who, who used to teach at Western Carolina, that pole was representing a kind of axis mundi, a center of the world. Um, it's a conduit that connects um, this world with the above world and the below world. That's a, that's a common symbol uh, across Southeastern cosmology. And so um, there on the grounds of what is now the, the Biltmore Estate today, um, there you had this ancestral Cherokee landscape creating a kind of axis mundi. Um, that particular place at Biltmore, like Dudua, is also one of these places where you feel just totally surrounded uh, by mountains while you're, while you're there. It feels like the center of the world. Um, another uh, kind of monumental construction that's happening uh, in the mountains that's really hard for us to see is the construction of segmented ditches. We don't understand these features very well. Uh, they don't appear, they're not highly visible in the landscape like mounds are. Uh, but this is a, an archaeological site from Cherokee, North Carolina, where there is a segmented circular ditch about the size of this auditorium, where there, there's a circle with um, breaks in the circle. Uh, these ditches would have been excavated around it. Earth would have been piled up right behind those ditches, um, creating a kind of circular enclosure 
not unlike some of those Newark earth, uh, earth mounds up in the Ohio Valley. It might be a similar kind of architectural grammar, um, just maybe representing, you know, sort of like an earth renewal ceremony where you're creating the earth around you. A lot of Southeastern Native American groups talk about the earth as an island of, of mud floating above uh, uh, sort of a void. Uh, it might be creating that, that kind of pattern, uh, but that's present there in our neck of the woods. And if you look at the distribution of these things across Western North Carolina, you've got the little blue polygons there, uh, low platform mounds, and then either uh, rectangular sort of, my, one of my colleagues calls them squircles, square circles, uh, earthworks or circular, circular earthworks spread out across this landscape. So, you know, um, sort of east of the, the vault of the mountains there, um, you have, you know, ancestral cares of people who are already out there um, commemorating this landscape with, with monumental earthworks. Um, uh, sort of moving forward in time to, to what archaeologists call the Mississippian period, and lots of, lots of good, um, uh, there's lots of good uh, displays here of Mississippian period artifacts that you can go see in the, in the heritage center if, if you haven't already. But in North Carolina, we, we, we talk about sort of two Mississippian phases um, in our part of the state, the, the Pisgah phase, which dates from roughly 81,000 to 1450, where we see the construction of um, uh, palisades, earth lodges, and, and platform mounds, uh, which is followed by the, the Kuala phase, which is a little bit further west, um, where we see a shift away from um, uh, platform mounds to, to council houses or townhouses. Um, uh, archaeologists working in the region think that these are, are both manifestations of, of ancestral Cherokee communities. Um, there's a kind of population <coughs> shift. Uh, out of sort of sort of away from the east and toward the west, that among other things might be associated with the Little Ice Age, when there's some pretty pretty severe uh, climate change that's happening. We also think that in the in the late 1300s, early 1400s, you have also because of the Little Ice Age, folks emptying out of the Ohio Valley, uh, which becomes almost just uninhabited. It's called the vacant quarter. People just whoosh, are gone out of the uh, Ohio Valley, uh, St. Louis area and have to go somewhere. And there's some interesting artifactual evidence suggesting that folks are maybe moving into our neck of the woods at that time too. Um, so, so a lot of migration uh, change there in this area. Um, this is an example of what the, one of these ancestral Cherokee villages would look like. This is the Warren Wilson on the campus of Warren Wilson University just outside of Asheville, North Carolina. Good evidence of a palisade there. Um, uh, a small community living, living there at Warren Wilson. And then off to the, uh, to the west, further west in Canton, at the Garden Creek site. In addition to that uh, woodland phase occupation, you've got mound building there as well. Um, possibly um, uh, a mound that was first built as an earth lodge uh, and then used as a platform for a Mississippian uh, uh, chief's house. Down in Franklin, North Carolina, you have the Nequahi Mound. This is photographed 1898. Our screen's a little stretched. So it looks a little longer and shorter than it really is, uh, but, but still, you know, very impressive um, uh, mound and, and to give some sort of sense of scale. Uh, the mound at Nequasi at its height was probably about the same size as the Town Creek Indian Mound in southwestern North Carolina. That one's been sort of restored a little bit. Um, I think every fifth grader in North Carolina uh, goes to Town Creek whether they want to or not. It's like sort of your North Carolina <laughs> field trip. Um, but this would have been a really impressive platform mound at Nequasi for a chief structure. Uh, it was then later used as the base for a Cherokee townhouse, um, and we've got you know, military records uh, describing uh, describing that. The distribution of, of these big Mississippian mounds across the region um, is a little more concentrated uh, uh, than uh, what we see with the distribution later of, of, of townhouses. It looks like more or less you've got one of these big Mississippian platform mounds al almost like county seats in North Carolina. These are counties. Um, our counties in North Carolina, up in the mountains, are defined by watersheds, essentially. You're basically looking at ridge lines with a, with a river running through it, is how, how those counties were surveyed. Um, and so kind of cool, uh, because you know, almost every county has one or two mounds, which may have served as, as kind of a central, um, central site, uh, a cent central sort of civic ceremonial site for, for those uh, communities. Um, uh, you've got possibly two, maybe, maybe paired Mounds there with Kadua and Nanunyi over over in Cherokee, and then uh, likewise Seat Tree and Notley uh, get you down here into our neck of the woods here in Georgia. Um, these, these big important sites. After about 
1540, roughly after uh, in DeSoto's entrada into, into um, the southeastern interior, you start to see a shift away in western North Carolina from plat platform mound construction to townhouse construction. These are the um, uh, sort of the main public buildings we associate with Cherokee Town. Uh, we know about these from historical records. Um, if you haven't read Timberlake's account of the townhouse at Shota, you should. Henry, Henry Timberlake, sort of ne'er-do-well British soldier who goes to stay with the Cherokee at, at Shota. Um, he describes what it's like to be inside this townhouse, which is, which is full of people. Um, this is an archaeological uh, excavation photo of the Coweta Creek uh, uh, site. This is down in Macon County, North Carolina. Well excavated Cherokee townhouse. These Cherokee townhouses were rebuilt in place over a period of time. Um, these were constructed out of uh, wooden, wooden support poles, um, uh, a little bit of wattle and daub on the side, and then sort of thatched uh, with, um, with, in some cases, tree bark and, and cane and, and matting. Um, given our, our humid southern Appalachian environment, they'd have to be replaced every 15 or 20 years. Um, and so these, these uh, townhouses were sort of decommissioned, collapsed, and rebuilt in place. And what you get over time is essentially construction of a mound as you rebuild these townhouses one on top of the other. And so um, I think rather intentionally with this townhouse construction, people are referencing that old architectural <laughs> symbolism of the mound, the, the, the maybe disc, disc of earth floating above the void, right? That same kind of architectural grammar is still there with, these, with this mound site. And so you see some connections that go back really as far as <clears throat> 2,000 years in, in North Carolina, that, that architectural grammar of the mound. Um, and, and just to kind of, you know, hit this point again, um, given the dozens of named towns across western North Carolina, South Carolina, eastern Tennessee, um, uh, if we don't know about them already archaeologically, there should be the remains of, of dozens of these townhouses lining all of these river valleys that, that we drive through, uh, drive through today. So again, if you get a chance, uh, you know, sometime to drive back through the Valley River, if you, if you, you know, go, go up to Murphy or up to Nantahala Gorge to get whitewater rafting or something, you know, as you drive along the, the Valley River, try and imagine that as this densely occupied uh, a Cherokee uh, territory where you've got, you know, as many as 10, uh, <clears throat> 10 named towns at any given time up and down that, that valley. Um, in those valley towns surrounded by uh, Cherokee farmsteads. Um, and another shot of the, the Gadua Mound, the, the, the Cherokee mother town from which uh, Cherokee emerged. The mound is actually right up sort of the, the top middle of the screen. You can see a little um, little sort of farm building off that dirt road that comes off the main road. The Gadua Mound is, is right there, um, located out in this, this broad floodplain. You know, there's an image of the mound in the 1930s when it was a, a little bit taller. But these are century located places. Your townhouses are usually um, located in the sort of up on the broad first terrace above a river, and so it's not going to flood, it's above the floodplain, but very close to your bottom land where you can, where you can do your farming. So these are very centrally, centrally located places out there on, on the landscape. Um, and so, while, while on the one hand, we can think about these mounds as sort of, you know, commemorative places, memorial places, places that, that, that Cherokee ancestors built that we can visit today, uh, that, that contain information um, about that give che living Cherokee a, a, a link to their ancestral territory. Mounds are also a vibrant uh, and, 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 and sort of, you know, um, uh, in some cases even contentious part of the landscape up in western North Carolina. So here's that image, that historic image of the Nequasi Mound in Franklin, North Carolina, which, which I encourage you guys to go visit at some point. Um, this was a photograph taken roughly um, 1890 that was then passed on to, to James Mooney uh, and makes its way into the, um, some early uh, government publications. Um, so we're looking at a mound that's over, over 100, 150 feet long, and there's a person on top for scale, you know, so at least a good, um, uh, you know, probably 20 feet tall or so at the time that photograph was taken. This is uh, a picture of the mound now with some students for scale in front of it. And it, of course, it looks much smaller. And the reason it looks much smaller, um, some of it is, is because that mound was, was plowed over once and was a little bit 
uh, has had some had some grading historically, um, but it's also because the town of Franklin, North Carolina, filled up the base of that mound um, with fill dirt to elevate the floodplain after a big historic flood uh, in the early 1900s. And so actually that mound looks smaller because it's covered in about five or 10 feet of fill dirt at the base. Um, what's interesting about that archeologically though is that most of that, a lot of that village is probably still intact underneath all that fill dirt. And, I'll, and I've got some other pictures that kind of prove that point. Um, here's an aerial shot of the, the mound in Franklin. And so there's the mound. You can see it really clearly in Google Earth. And it's just capped in concrete. It's just surrounded in concrete. This is, uh, this is uh, West Main Street. That's East Main Street. Um, you know, there's the mound on this little island. The mound was preserved by the town in the 1930s in kind of a community effort, which was led, among other things, by school children um, who wanted to preserve the mound. And so the town completely unironically took a lot of pride in having preserved the mound. And they did, in fact, preserve the mound. But it's a very sort of like, in terms of historic preservation, like just a kind of like George Washington slept here kind of preservation, right? Like if you just preserve the one building, then you've done it, you've preserved it. But, but this landscape, of course, has just been uh, 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 you know, totally developed in the 20th century. We've got a little bit of a park over here. Um, this is actually kind of a wetland. It, it gets pretty swampy up there, which is which why. And, and this entire landscape out here is covered in about five to 10 feet of uh, fill dirt <laughs> to elevate the, um, the, these buildings above the floodplain. That looks unhistorically. Um, much of your village area for this mound is probably over here on, on higher ground. I imagine that the Mississippi and Cherokee folks who are living there are probably planting their crops, planting gardens and, and corn out here where it's a little bit lower, uh, lower, lower territory. Um, but you've got to have a mound. I mean, you have a mound. You've got to have a plaza out there. There's got to be domestic structures out there. Um, uh, so in the one sense, it's incredibly developed. On, on the other sense, in another sense, it's, it's very much preserved. Um, so zooming in, um, in 2016, over a summer, I uh, had the opportunity to help out with a, an EPA-funded brownfield cleanup really close to the mound. This was the site of an old oil, uh, oil factory, so the old-fashioned you know, gas station, you know, um, a place to go get oil for your, for your houses or for, for industry or what have you. Um, oil tanks there leaked into the ground, um, uh, producing a, you know, no small amount of worry given the location of the Little Tennessee River right there next to this oil field. And so a group called the Main Spring Conservation Trust took clean up. And I wish that slide was in smell vision <laughs> <laughs> so that you could experience what it's like to do a brownfield cleanup. <laughs> this track hoe is removing the fuel, fuel and fuel oil that's leaked into the soil. That's me wondering where I went wrong. Um, <laughs> what, what I'm is I'm monitoring uh, the backhoe as it removes contaminated fill dirt. And my job on this project, uh, and, and just to put this back into perspective, okay, that, that backhoe is working right here. So the mound is right here, which makes this dangerously close to where the village is and where Cherokee graves are gonna be, right? That's why, that's why we, we have an archeologist out there. Um, that, that backhoe removed 14 feet of fill dirt that had been built up. But here's what's interesting. At the bottom of that is, uh, it was grass and Coke bottles and SO oil cans and a bottle of Texas Pete hot sauce, um, <laughs> <laughs> which we opened. Um, <laughs> and so what's interesting about that is that land wasn't graded before it was filled, it was just filled. And so in fact, that village is still there, which is really interesting, right? So it's under, it's under as much as, in some cases, 13, 14 feet of fill dirt. But academically speaking, hypothetically, you, right, that those have not been graded. All the Cherokee graves, and some Cherokee graves that are associated with that town, those, those are still there. So on the one hand, you know, Nequasi has been boxed in um, as, as this kind of like just George Washington slept here, here's a historical site. On the other hand, it's very much uh, a preserved, intact <coughs> Cherokee village just not in the way that we would typically think about it. And, and just to you know, kind of put this in perspective, 
This is the, the map of the Coweta Creek site, which was completely excavated. There is your townhouse and, and an associated uh, plaza, domestic structures. Um, one of those circular, semicircular ditch features from the woodland period, which is here's Sir Grimlock's first memory of that site 2,000 years ago. That's all there at Coweta Creek. At the Nequasi site, that probably shifted uh, to get people out of the, the lowlands and up onto this higher ground a little bit. But, but you know, I'll bet anybody in here dinner that, that most of that site is still intact underneath all, all of that filter. The Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians for years has tried to purchase the mound from the town of Franklin, um, but it's been really contentious because the town of Franklin, again, unironically, takes pride in having this mound, having purchased the mound, having cared for it, but they have not been great stewards. Um, in 2012, uh, a town manager who was concerned about mowing the mound uh, sprayed herbicide on the mound. And just to make a personal anecdote about this, that was during my postdoc years at the University of Georgia, and I was bringing a, a group of international anthropologists from UGA up to the mountains to, to see mounds and visit some archaeological sites. And I brought them up there right after all the grass had died. And the mound was just brown uh, with, with dead grass. And I didn't know what had happened. Um, it was one of the most awkward experiences of my short academic career. Um, but, but this, of course, was the, the tribe was devastated. Um, and, and really pushed at that point to try to buy the mound or to say, look, we will take care of this because you clearly can't do it. You know, just let, let us care for the mound. But, but, but because, because of the politics of the town of Franklin, you know, giving ownership to the Eastern Band, that's incredibly contentious. That's probably not going to happen anytime soon. So, so these mounds are not just archaeological sites. These are living contentious places. There, there, people, people debate, people argue about how we should think about these places. Um, the tribe has managed to, to get a little bit of a foothold here. Um, they recently purchased the tract just to the um, left of the mound there, where you can see that, that red roof building right next to the mound. Um, they've just purchased that adjacent land, um, and there are plans with Mainspring Conservation Trust to uh, basically green up this uh, sort of concrete landscape to convert a lot of this to green, to, 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 to green space. And so I think that's a step in the right, in the right direction. Um, uh, but, but this obviously is, is a very difficult, contentious project. Um, a better model, and, and, and this was an easier, sort of an easier lift in a lot of ways because it was, a, it was in a rural environment, but the, the Cowie Mound um, in Macon County, North Carolina, just a few miles away from the Nequasi Mound, was a mound that was preserved on a large agricultural tract, which had not been developed uh, really ever, had just been farmed. So the mound itself um, is a little bit unusual. It actually sits up on, on, on sort of a bluff above the Little Tennessee River. And um, the Eastern Band of Cherokee, in collaboration with Maine Spring Conservation Trust, which at that time was actually known as the Little uh, Tennessee Land Trust, was able to um, uh, purchase that land into a conservation easement. The tribe now manages that. Um, that was a really, really good collaborative project where uh, multiple stakeholders were able to, to come together. Um, and at the Cowie Mount today, among other things, um, it's used as a place for the, um, the R.T. Carr project, which is a revitaling, tradi revitalizing traditional ancestral craft resources project. And so out at Cowie, um, uh, folks from Eastern Band uh, plant traditional native river cane which they then take their kids out there and teach them how to make baskets using river cane as well as using other kind of plant, uh, plant resources. And so um, that also is a place that is not just a uh, historic mound, an archaeological site, but it's this vital, vibrant place on the Cherokee landscape where elders and kids get together um, on ancestral ground to, to, to pass on traditional knowledge. Um, uh, opportunities like that are rarer because of the um, sort of history of development, um, but, but when it can happen, it's really great. I mean, it's, 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 it's a really cool opportunity, and I think um, things like the Cowie Mound really um, present a, a kind of model for, for how those kinds of preservation projects can work. Okay. Um, and just some, just some closing thoughts, like, you know, if, if, again, if there are more undergraduates there, this is like the one thing I want the undergraduates to remember, right, <laughs> is that from this traditional Cherokee perspective, um, these mounds are living places. The fires still burn at the bottom of these mounds. When, when I was a, a, a 
postdoc and first started working up in um, West North Carolina, um, I took a I took a sort of day long car ride with T J Holland, and T J Holland is the cultural resources manager for the for the Eastern Band, and he drove me um, very rapidly um, through the Valley Towns, <laughs> up up and down seventy four um, in the Nantahala Gorge. Um, up into Robbinsville, pointing out all these places on the landscape, pointing out places where, where mounds are, and 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 you know he told me that day that if I learned nothing else is that these places are not just archaeological sites; these are living places on the landscape. You know these mounds contain um, uh, sacred fires that we think are that we we mean TJ speaking as a church person, the church people think are still burning. They contain Cherokee graves. Um, if the graves are not. Uh, underneath the mound, they're going to be out in, in the plaza area, so, so they, 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 they contain the graves of our ancestors. They're places that need to be treated with, with the utmost respect, and they're not just a thing of the past, they're a thing of the present that, that connect us with, with our history. Um, and, and so um, uh, w right now, as, as sort of as a scholar, when I think about these places, um, archaeologists have lots of models, lots of ideas for what we think these, these mounds are about. Sometimes it's informed by you know, political economy. Sometimes we think about these mounds like as capitals uh, of, of a kind of you know, regional system. Um, sometimes it's informed by, by, by ethnography, but, but I think it also needs to be informed by that current, contemporary Cherokee perspective that, that these mounds are, are places that connect us with our ancestors and are still um, uh, alive on this landscape. So that's my talk. Thanks. And I think I've, I've left a, a few minutes for questions, so we can we can definitely take some questions. Just a couple of acknowledgments. Um, lots of thanks here to the the, the many people who helped uh, make this research project possible over the years. The Kawita LTR with the University of Georgia, my various employers over the years. Um, this is a slide where I, I thank every archaeologist in North Georgia and <laughs> Western North Carolina. And then, just for those of you who are interested in these topics, uh, these are some recommended books, some good reading. So I'll just leave that slide up if, if you want something to look at.